Hi, it's Grandma here, and I'm reading Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. And today's chapter is called Whitewashing the Fence. And often this is the chapter that people um, think of when, when you uh, mention that you're reading Tom Sawyer. Uh, in the previous chapter, uh, Tom got into some trouble, and um, Aunt Polly is making him do chores on Saturday, which is normally the day he plays. Now, whitewashing the fence isn't quite painting because the whitewash can uh, um, wear off in the rain, but it still is uh, not just cleaning the fence, it is uh, putting a, it's a coating of lime um, and uh, water, and uh, <clears throat> it was a cheap substitute for paint. Whitewashing the fence. Saturday morning was come and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with light. There was a song in every heart and if the heart was young, the music it issued at the lips. There was cheer in every face and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence, nine feet high. <sighs> Life to him seemed hollow, and passed it along the topmost plank, redipped his brush, and passed it along again. Repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of Aunt Polly's unwashed fence, and sat down discouraged. Jim, he's the Negro boy, came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail singing buffalo gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto, Negro boys and girls were always there, awaiting their turn, resting, trading playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that although the pump was only 150 yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour. And even then, somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, Ah, uh, say, Jim, I'll fetch that water for you if you whitewash some. Jim shook his head and said, Can't, Mars Tom. Oh, missus, she told me I got to go and get this water and not stop fooling around with anybody. She say she spec Mars Tom going to ask me to whitewash, and she told me go long and tend to my business. She loud she tend to do to whitewashing. <sighs> oh, never you mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I won't be gone only a minute. She won't even know. Oh, I dasn't, Mars Tom. Oh, missus, she taken tarred the head off me. Deed she would. <sighs> she, she never licks anybody. Wax him over the head with her thimble, and who cares for that, I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry, Jim. I'll give you a marble. I'll give you a white alley. Jim began to waver. White alley, Jim, and it's a bully taw. My, that's a mighty gay marble, I tell you. But Mars Tom, I's powerful afraid of old Mrs. And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley, and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. In another moment, he was flying down the street with his pail and a tingling rear. Tom was whitewashing with vigor and Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. So Aunt Polly was keeping an eye on Jim. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he'd planned for this day and his sorrows multiplied. 
Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burned him like fire. He got out his worldly wealth and examined it, bits of toys, marbles and trash, enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy as much, so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pockets and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment, an inspiration burst upon him. Nothing less than great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers, hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boy whose ridicule he had been dreading, Ben's gait was the hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipation high. He was eating an apple and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep tone, ding, dong, dong, ding, dong, dong, for he was, per, per, <coughs> excuse me, personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the street, leaned far over to starboard, and rounded to ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was person personating the big Missouri. That's the name of the boat. And be considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own deck giving the orders and expecting them. Stop her, sir! ting a -ling, ling The headway ran almost out. He drew up slowly toward the sidewalk. Ship up to back. On the starboard. ting a ling a -ling. Chow, chow, ch chow, chow. His right hand, meantime, described stately circles, for he was representing a four, 40-foot wheel. So what they are doing, they live on the Mississippi River and there are no automobiles, but they are playing at driving a boat, basically. Today, boys might pretend to be in a car and making the sounds of a car, but he's making the sounds of a boat. Stop the stabber, ting a ling ling stop the labber, come ahead on the stabber, cop stopper, let her outside, turn over slow, Ting a ling ling chow. Get out that headline lively now. Come out with your spring line. What are you about there? Take a turn around that stump with the bite of it. Stand by that stage now. Let her go. Done with the engine, sir. Ting a ling ling. Shh, shh, shh. Trying the gauge cocks. Tom went on whitewashing. Paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a minute and then said, Hiya, you're up a stump, aren't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with his eye of an artist, that, like this, with a paintbrush in his hand. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the results as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, Hello, old chap, you got to work, hey? Tom wheeled suddenly say, why, it's you, Ben. I weren't noticing. Say, I'm a gonna in a swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, what do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, well, maybe it is, maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that you like it. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to take the note of the effect, add a touch here, there, criticized the effect again. Ben, watching every move, getting more and more interested and more and more absorbed. Presently, he said, Say, Tom, let me...
me whitewash a little. Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. No, no, no. I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence. Right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind. And she wouldn't either. Yes, she's awfully particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful. I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, oh, maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No? Is that so? Oh, come now, let me just try. Only just a little. I'd let you if you was me, Tom. Oh, Ben, I'd like to. Honest engine, but Aunt Polly, well, Jim wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him. Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now, don't you see how I'm fixed? If you tackled this fence and anything was to happen to it, oh, shucks, I'd be just as careful. Now, let me try, say. I'll give you the core of my apple. Well, here, no, Ben, now, don't, I'm afraid. I'll give you all of my apple. Tom gave up his brush with reluctance in his face, but Allard's alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, dangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite in good repair. And when he played out, Johnny Miller brought in a dead rat and a string to swing it with, and so on and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came, from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had, beside the things before mentioned, 12 marbles, parts of a Jew's harp, a piece of blue bottle glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, the handle of a knife, four pieces of orange peel, and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice, good, idle time all the while. Plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it, namely that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling tin pins or climbing Mount Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy men, gentlemen in England who drive four horse passenger coaches 20 or 30 miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, they would turn it into work, and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstance and then wended toward headquarters to report. Now, this is a very famous chapter because of how his attitude for work in, encouraged others to do the work for him. Uh, it has become kind of a, 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 a standard story in American culture that uh, someone who flimflams a person, in other words, cons them into doing their work and making them think it's fun, is like Tom Sawyer getting his fence whitewashed. Now, in Hannibal today, they have um, 
they have what is known as Tom Sawyer days. And in that uh, part of it, it consists of a contest with boys dressed like Tom Sawyer, whitewashing the fence. And my nephew, Todd, lived in Hannibal at the time, and he was one of the Tom Sawyers that was used to whitewash the fence during Tom Sawyer days. Hope you enjoyed this chapter. The next chapter is called General Tom. Surely they don't mean Tom Sawyer as a general. We'll, we'll see. Bye-bye.